familia presenta Resultado de los niños en las relaciones del mismo sexo Thank you for having me today. I'm sorry I'm going to have to deliver this in English. Uh, until about five years ago, uh, there was nothing I had ever said in my professional career that even seemed remotely uh, internationally interesting. Uh, that changed several years ago, especially with this study. Uh, but I'm going to sort of walk you through what this study is about, and I want to talk about Uh, a study that came out even after mine, and sort of give you a, a sense of um, the territory in doing social science research on pretty sensitive issues like this one. Uh, so I'm going to introduce you to the, the New Family Structure Study, which was a, uh, a study that I um, was principal investigator of. It was published in 2012, and Uh, my, the last three and a half years have, have not been like my previous 41 and a half years. Uh, it's, the, sort of the amount of criticism leveled at me has been uh, intense, right? Not only me, but at, at a handful of other people. Now, one of the reasons that is is because up until about 1994, I think, I'm going to set my slides here. Up until about 1994, Social scientists of the family kind of agreed on uh, what was best for children. Right? There was a, a Princeton sociologist, there was a Wisconsin sociologist who had written a book and had talked about how they could not think of how to design a, a, a better organized situation for children than for two biological parents. Because it had it all. It had uh, two people to care for you, people who were biologically related to you to care for you, which would minimize the likelihood that somebody would abuse you. It had checks and balances. I mean, complementarity between men and women has, has a, a unique kind of a check and balance uh, because fathers and mothers bring different things to the parenting uh, practice. That was 1994, not so long ago. But in the 20 years since, the tide has changed. The data has not really changed. The interest for social scientists to admit that a mother and a father are still the best arrangement for children has receded rapidly. The data has not changed much. The nerve or the uh, ability to speak clearly in this domain has changed. <clears throat> oh. I'm going to tell you a little bit about where we're at. One of the th accusations that has been leveled at social scientists like me is that our study, and I'll describe it to you in a minute, It sort of thwarted or sought to thwart what has become common knowledge. And one of the frustrating things is, is that the common knowledge is built around a, a small number of studies that have been republished and published in different form for the last 20 years. So I like to say, you know, when the score is about 50 to 2, you know, if this were a football game, 50 to 2, this would be a, a disaster, right? But that is kind of the, the, the scholarly environment in which I waded into. There was only one or two studies that had, had raised questions about the wisdom of uh, two mothers or two fathers raising a child. The problem is when one study has One of those studies, one of those 50 studies, comes from a, a, a sample of 44 children. And that's been published in 14 to 16 different articles. And another study has come from a non-random 78 kids whose, parent, whose mother volunteered them in San Francisco, Washington, Boston, 78 children. 
That's been published over 26 times. So you have 26 of the one, 18 of the other, and a handful of other studies, and it's a landslide. You can say that the social science around same-sex parenting is clear that it's not a problem for children, but they've only come from about two or three different data collection projects, both of which I've had significant problems with. One of the problems is, in this domain, you, you think science should work with openness, right? That particular study of 78 children, which has been published in 26 peer-reviewed journals, is not public data. I've asked the investigators, could I see that data? No. It could be completely fabricated, for all I know. I don't think so. But it could be, and I wouldn't know. None of us would know. So about four years ago, several of us waded into this, this mess and said, we want to collect our own data. We want to make it a, a, a nationally representative study so that we are not just studying children from San Francisco or Boston or Washington. We want to get a, a spectrum of children in the United States. So I pooled together a team, several sociologists, economists, psychologists, family studies professors, and we set about envisioning how would we do this. We met in 2011 in Austin and decided on the framework of how we were going to approach this study. But we were essentially spitting into the wind, meaning everything, the, the, the political winds were against us. <clears throat> Claims had moved from, oh, yeah, from 1994 when a parent, uh, a mother and a father are ideal for children, to, well, maybe they're not necessary, to maybe there's no differences at all, to even claims that two women are better at raising children than a man and a woman. So we waded into this, this domain where, the, in the popular imagination, people still had a sense of, yes, a stable married mom and dad makes sense. But all the experts were starting to tell them that maybe that wasn't the case. So we waited in thinking, maybe it's important to get a, a, a cross-section of the country. Maybe your sample really matters. Maybe it's important to get more than 44 children in one study that's been published 16 times. Maybe it's important to get more than 78 children in a study that's been published 26 times. So what we decided to do is to sample as many people as we could in this study. We talked to 15,058 people. And we decided, you know what? It's not enough just to speak to the parents. In this, this sort of the famous San Francisco, Washington, Boston study, it's strictly until the children were teenagers, they were talking to the parents, parents who had signed up their family to be in this study, right? And a lot of us looked at this and thought, you know, it's probably not ideal if the parents are speaking on behalf of the children. Let's talk to children after they have grown up, left the household, and ask them about their reflections upon life growing up and life today. So what we wanted to do is tackle this idea of source bias. Maybe parents who have signed their children up to be in a study, those parents were all two women, maybe they are invested in particular answers here. Maybe it's better to talk to the children after they have left the household. Maybe we need to get a larger sample. So the new family structure study was large, and yet I think it wasn't large enough. 
one of the key criticisms that came our way was that, Mark, you only found, out of 15,000 random cases in the United States, you only found 248 cases of adult children who said their mother or father had had a same-sex relationship. And of that, as I'll show you shortly, there was very little stability in the household. But we had screened 15,058 kids asking kids, I call them kids, they were 18 to 39 years old, right? They had left the household. Anybody who's younger than me is a kid. <clears throat> it was nationally representative. I cared about it. The scholars in our group cared about it. Once this was published, nobody cared about the national representativeness. They hated the results and pilloried it. It was very detailed, and I think maybe too detailed. We asked probably 60 different questions about their life growing up, their life now, like are they employed, what do they think about their mother, how do they get along with their father, um, did they complete college, uh, how do they get along with their children now, do they have to, a whole gamut of sort of general social and psychological questions, right? Because we were wading into territory where most of the research that had come before us was focused on how the children thought about their mothers, right? Like, well, what kid is willing to sort of speak ill of their mother, especially when they're in the household? Right? It, it was very focused on sort of parent-child relationships, right? That, that's something. But what about the other things that parents do to prepare their children for life? And what about the things, how do their children fare once they've left the nest? We conducted with a, a fantastic research firm that has the largest nationally representative panel or group of adults uh, in the United States. And I made it publicly accessible three months after I released the study which is extremely rare. I mean, but this is how science is supposed to work. You share your data. I could have hidden my data, and nobody could have reanalyzed it and criticized it, etc. But there's a lot of different ways to do social science research. There's a lot of different ways to do a study. But it's a scientific value to make your data public, even though I was under no obligation to do so. I still haven't gotten data from this other study and a variety of other studies that I've wanted to look at over the years. <clears throat> but there are several things that the NFSS is not. It is not a longitudinal study, meaning we don't track people over time. We're not able to sort of suggest strong ideas of causation. Right? This is normal in sociology and psychology. We're not typically able to say, I have figured out that X causes Y, without a doubt. Most of the time we're only able to say, you know, there's a pretty strong relationship between X and Y after I control for A, B, C, D, and E. But it's not, I'm not able to suggest causation. This is just a picture, this one and the next one. This is the original study. The next slide is the... Uh, as soon as this, the first study was released... I can go back to that, the other one. Can you go back one? As soon as this was released on June 10, 2012, at midnight, by 6 in the morning I was getting hostile email and people were seeking to tear it down. Like, Scholarship, you know, if you think back a, just a couple decades ago, moves at this, a snail's pace. Right? Scholarly arguments typically take years to work themselves out. Right? The American Psychological Association had decided they didn't like this study within two days and had just posted on their, their website that they, they thought this was a suspect study for ridiculous reasons. Some wise minds 
inserted themselves and said, you know what, if people have problems with this study, they should have problems with every study that came before it, because this has the strongest and largest sample that we've seen yet. So, a few months later, I responded to critics with the next study. I answered critics of this with additional analyses. Anyways, I'm going to tell you about some of those analyses momentarily. I just wanted to just see a photograph of what that looked like. All right. One of the key conclusions in this data, no matter how you analyze it, no matter if you are rabidly against same-sex parenting or think it's the best thing in the world, you will find in this data profound instability among the children who's, who replied that their mother or their father had a same-sex relationship. Now, why did we ask it like that? Uh, that has come into question. At that initial meeting around the table, we thought, how do people come into families that we would call same-sex families? Right? How, do they how do children happen to come into them? And the, the, the highlights in the media today are, oh, assisted reproductive technology for women, or adoption or surrogacy for two men. The media portrays that these children come into the household as infants. That is so uncommon still today, it was almost unheard of among kids who were, you know, adults who were 18 to 39 as of just a few years ago. Right? So we decided that, how are we going to get around this question? We're going to ask them about a parent's same-sex relationship, because a lot of them were going to be the product of a heterosexual union, gone sour, and then at some point in the time, mother took up a relationship with another woman for some degree of time, some period of time. So we, had, we wanted to capture all of these ways, right? The children who were born from a heterosexual union, the children who were adopted by a, a gay or lesbian couple, the children who were the product of surrogacy, which was almost unheard of then, Assisted reproductive technology, again, pretty uncommon. But we wanted to, to cap, because kids come into these households in a variety of different ways, but the primary way was still a failed heterosexual union, right? So among all of those, I think there were 158 who said their mother had had a same-sex relationship, 57% of them said they had lived with her and her partner for at least four months, okay? Which means 43% of them did not live with her and her partner. The respondent said, my mother had a same-sex relationship while I was growing up. But her partner didn't live with us. She was just in a relationship, right? Some people said, Rignaris, you shouldn't include those people. Like, I think if, if my mother, while I was growing up, had had a same-sex relationship, it would have been influential in my life, even if she didn't live with the partner. Who am I to say this doesn't matter for children? 23% right? of them said they had lived with her partner, her and her partner, for at least three years. So you start to see that these numbers get fairly small. We only found two who stayed with mom and her partner for 18 years. I thought this was rather telling. Critics thought this was terrible. Critics said, Mark, you are missing all of these kids who have grown up in stably coupled lesbian households. And I said, where are they? they in, among the children who were 18 to 39 in the U.S. as of a few years ago, that phenomenon almost didn't exist. It is a media creation. It does exist. It's just not that common. Even when I think about some of the key spokespersons for uh, same-sex unions in the, in the United States, children, if you unravel their childhood almost to a person, they didn't enter that union at birth. They entered that union a few years later, sometimes several years later. So they fit into here, not into here. Among those who said their father had had a same-sex relationship, was about half as many. 
Only 42% said they actually lived with dad at that time. And if father was entering into a same-sex union, the great likelihood was that mom had custody of this child. The child did not live with dad, right? This also was, people were criticizing me for like, well, why are you paying any attention to these kids? Like, I'm paying attention to them because their father was in a same-sex relationship, and it's a significant thing in children's lives, even if they don't live with them for years. <coughs> 24% of that group said they lived with him and his partner for at least four months, which means 76% did not live with dad and his partner. Okay? All right, next slide, please. So where did these kids come from? This is sort of over time. One of the things that is uh, the critics honed in on but never gave me credit for was I had a household calendar in this study, I asked every child whose mom and dad weren't together for an entire 18 years, who did you live with? Who was in your household at birth when you were born? Who was in your household when you were one? Who was in your household when you were two, three, four, five, six, 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 18, right? So they had the opportunity to say, oh yes, mom left my dad at age three and then stepfather moved in. Stepfather was there for five years, and then stepfather left, and then it was just me and mom and my siblings for the next ten years. We gave them the opportunity to tell us the complexity in their household, okay? Here's what that complexity revealed for those kids who said, my mother had a same-sex relationship, right? 55% of them were born, or at age one, roughly, shortly after they were born, were with their biological mother and their biological father, okay? So 55% unarguably were born into a mar or a, a union of their mother and father. They weren't necessarily married, right? Okay? Another 5, 10, 15, almost 30%, over 30%, 32%, were only in, with their mom, right? So they were basically, they were, they were born into a single-parent household. So you've got up to 88%, 89% of the kids who said their mom had had a same-sex relationship were either born to a heterosexual union that failed, or they were born to a single mother household. Okay? That's just the reality. One of the key parts of this study was not seeking to show causation, it was just seeking to map out reality. right? give you an overview of where these children live and live and how they are faring. Okay? Obviously, if your mom had a same-sex relationship, this was going to diminish rapidly. Okay? A lot of times, too, the same-sex relationship wasn't a decision of, oh, I think I'm actually a lesbian, not straight, I'm leaving your dad and I'm taking up with a woman. That's usually not how it goes. Usually it's dad leaves, there's, a, there's a, uh, another man, and then at some point there's a woman. Sometimes for a while, sometimes for a long while, sometimes a sequence of women. Okay? This is just the reality. We come to this study of uh, household structures with sort of a naivete, thinking, oh, there's, you know, people have either grown up in a step family or they've grown up in a single parent family or they've grown up in a married household. In reality, households are messy. A lot of you know this, right? There's, there's a sequence of people who come and go, right? Who lived with their biological mother and their mother's partner in the household? That's this gray group, right? We're talking about 2% were born into this. And it grows slowly over time as they age. But the peak time in which a child said, I live with mom and her partner, was roughly like age 13 to 16. <clears throat> this last category, mom, girlfriend's part of mom, mother's girlfriend, and the biological father, this is not about like, oh, there's three people in this household. This is a, they have joint custody, right? But there is a, a woman in the household, right? But this is a small fraction. 
this slide is intended to convey to you kind of the, the, the messiness that is the lives of children who say they, their mother had a same-sex partnership. All right. So, how did these kids fare? I'm not going to go into great detail. I'll show you some numbers. But when we compared them to stably married households, right, people criticized me for doing that, said you shouldn't compare them to stable mom and dad households. That you, you just kind of, that's not fair. I'm like, my job here isn't to be fair. My job is to sort of compare them to ideals, right? If, in fact, the gold standard is mom and dad stay married and engaged in your life until you leave the household, then I should compare that against that. Right? When I compare children against that, these are 18 to 39-year-olds whose mom had a same-sex relationship. These are the statistically significant differences, all of them in the direction that you might imagine. Right? Children who have mothers who have had same-sex relations are more likely to be cohabiting as adults. They're more likely to have drastically to get public assistance as a child and as an adult. They're reporting it now. They're less likely to be employed full-time as adults, more likely to be unemployed, far less likely to identify as heterosexual. This was the earliest indication that something was awry. Uh, sort of the, the scholarly left denied that it was true and then finally decided, okay, it's not a problem, so let's just admit that it's true, because it is true, and we detected it profoundly. They're more likely to be currently or recently in psychotherapy, cheating, having cheated on their, their current partner or spouse, more likely to have, I mean, the list can go on and on. Um, a lot of these have to do with sexual behavior, but not all of them. I mean, having a, issues with attachment, more likely to be depressed. And here's, these are interesting. They are more likely to have issues with their family of origin. Said, you know, I'm still dealing with things that happen when I grow up, right? I'm not going to blame that all on mom and her partner. A lot of it has to do with mom and the sequence of people that were in the household at different times, at least one of which was a woman. Next slide, please. This is the children, adult children of fathers who've had a same-sex relationship. Again, it's a smaller number, about half as many. It's also a, a fewer outcomes that are influenced by them. Now, you could say, well, does that mean it's worse to have a mother who's had a same-sex relationship than a father? I don't, I don't have the data to say that. All I know is that there are fewer of them. And any time you have st a fewer, smaller number, it's harder to detect statistically significant differences. Right? In fact, one of the dirty secrets of the social science in this domain is that when you only have 44 cases, as that one study did, or 78 cases like that other study did, you'll often lack what's called statistical power to detect real differences in the population. Right? So you could say, I went, you know, I went to college and this another person didn't even finish high school. But if, if we don't have enough cases, we could say, oh, we don't see any difference between these two. Right? because there's just not enough cases. So there are fewer cases of this, and I'm not surprised that there are fewer outcomes. So these are the differences between children who are now 18 to 39 who grew up with a stable married mom and dad, and children who, who said, my father had a same-sex relationship. I, this is the only thing that they did that was more than kids from stably married, they, they're more likely to vote. Otherwise, they're more likely to be on public assistance as a child. This is due largely to insecurity, right? And the lack of uh, stable earners. Lots of different things, right? I'll show you a couple numbers. <coughs> I should go to the, the last slide. The next couple slides, you'll see uh, comparisons of different kinds of groups. The first column will be intact biological family. Then you have adopted by age two, parents were married until one parent died, and the parent who survived had no subsequent relationship. These kids actually look pretty good, right? I always uh, joke that, you know, divorce is bad for kids, but, you know, 
better to have died than to have gotten a divorce. For the sake of your children, right? This is true. Parents married through childhood but later divorced, grew up largely in a step family, single mother, single mother never married. And then that last column you'll see is mom had a lesbian relationship. And then I focused on the half of that group that lived with her, her and her mother and her partner. All right. Next slide, please. Okay, so I want to focus on this column and this column. And I just sort of picked a handful of uh, measures. This is the, the respondent said that my family received social welfare or public assistance while we were growing up. <clears throat> if you were in an intact biological family, 17% of them said, yes, my mom and or my, my family had received community assistance. That's compared to 70% of the kids who said, my mom had a lesbian relationship and I lived with her and her partner. Again, th those weren't necessarily long relationships. Some of them only lasted three, four years. But what about currently on public assistance? So this is not just what happened to you as a child. This is what ha what are you, what's your life like today? 10% say I'm on public assistance right now compared to 49%. That's a dramatic difference. Currently unemployed, eight versus 40. 40% of that group who say, I lived with mom and her partner while I was growing up, 40% say, I, I don't have a job now. Right? Recently are currently in therapy for a psychological or relationship or anxiety issue, eight versus 17. Had an affair while I, am, I was married or cohabiting as an adult. 13 versus 38%. Again, I'm not going to blame this on mom's partner. This has a lot to do with, like, you model the behavior you've seen. And if your, model, if your mother modeled relationship behavior that had a sequence of partners, well, then you are more than likely apt to as well. Ever had a sexually transmitted infection? Eight versus 26. Ever touched sexually by an adult? Two versus 26. I take pains to say that I'm not, I don't think this is a mother or her partner abusing a child. It is, they have created a household in which there is profound instability, a lot of unrelated people entering this child's life. It just elevates the risk of this happening, right? In this case, 13-fold. Ever forced to have sex against your will at some point? Eight versus 27 percent. I'm not going to focus on these, but you can tend to see that they tend to fall between here and here. I didn't use these in the study, but I thought, it's pretty interesting. Let's just look at some other health-related outcomes that you couldn't draw a particular causal arrow between the sexual behavior of your parents and your life now. But it's really rather interesting. 26% of this group said, I don't have health insurance. 58% of that group said, I don't have health insurance now. High blood pressure. I mean, why would, why would we see high blood pressure association? Like, there are health benefits to being in a stable family that never go away. They just never go away. And one of the interesting things here is that here, this is instability. This is instability. This is instability. And yet, the numbers do not tend to compare to these. Sometimes they do. Self-reports as having a temper. I don't know if I have a temper, but sometimes I do, right? And my 18, but 18 percent said yes, compared to almost double that. This sort of long reach of what happened in your childhood, right? Okay, next slide, please. So why such different findings? I don't think my findings are very different at all from what came before it. The key is. The sampling strategy was different. We talked to a random sample of people. We described the, the complexity of their lives, right? We didn't focus on handpicking 78 kids whose mom signed them up for the study. In fact, this particular study, which has been published on, what did I say, 26 times? Like, they, 
the kids who are participating in that study today, it's still going on, like, absolutely know it's been used as a political hammer for gay rights. And they're still participating in it. Right? When I started my study, I said, we are not going to show our cards. We're not going to sort of say, here's what we're looking for. I call it the new family structure study. I want to know about the diversity of kids in different families. Right? So I don't think my study is very different at all. It's just a very, quite different sampling strategy, a much stronger one, I think. Some critics say it's all about instability. It's not about having a same-sex partner. I don't know how to answer that. They could be right. All I know is that the children who said my mother or father had a same-sex relationship typically lived in lives of profound relationship instability in their parents. Right? Maybe we're entering an era where that's not going to be the case. And a lot of people sort of said, oh, Mark, that's an older era. There's so much more stability now in same-sex households. I say, show me the data, okay? It doesn't exist yet. What if it's about selectivity? Uh, one of the things social scientists who study family and marriage like to say is, you know, Mark, it's not, the, it's not that marriage helps children. It's that the kinds of people who are apt to get married are going to have better children in the first place. But then I think, how do you form marriageable people, right? By the very experience of marital stability in their own lives. Right? Marriage pays benefits not just to your children, pays it to your grandchildren as well. Next slide, please. So, there are fair criticisms of the study. I've heard them all. Uh, and they started on day one, and they included, uh, they got ad hominem personal attacks. The journal editor, of the, the editor of the journal that published this, peer-reviewed journal, uh, was sued, came under fierce attack, and eventually he retired early from his job. Right? I'm very sad about that. Like, other people had to pay costs for this to come to light. Is that um, the labels? I had talked about gay father and lesbian mother. I probably shouldn't have done that. Uh, it was not intentional. So then, in the follow-up in November, I said, "Okay, mothers who've had a lesbian relationship, fathers who've had a gay relationship, right? Because I don't want to. I don't want to suggest that I know their sexual identity because we didn't ask them. We asked them about the relationship behavior. This is a mystery here." Like, what about these women who probably are bisexual? I don't know, right? I mean, bisexuality is more common among women than lesbianism is, okay? All I asked was about if they were in a relationship with another woman, which technically is a lesbian relationship. So that's what I called it. Some people said, Mark, you're just capturing all these bisexual women. I don't know. People complained about the ethnic diversity of the sample. I complain about this other samples, like you're just handpicking lesbians from San Francisco, Washington, and Boston to be in this sample. I get a nationally representative sample, and lo and behold, there's plenty of African Americans and Latinos in this, and people start complaining that it's not white enough. I mean, sociologists seldom complain that something's not white enough, but they did about this. They said, I'm comparing apples to oranges, right? Mark, you're comparing people who are in who are biological parents to a child, to people who could not possibly both be biological parents to a child. I said, yeah, that, that's, just, that's just reality. I can't fix that. I, some people said, oh, I'm, not, I'm picking up on foster care experiences of, of lesbian couples who are adopting kids out of the foster care system. I went back to the data because I asked if they had been in the foster care system. This is not responsible for the findings. And in the end, people said, Mark, you just don't have a large enough sample of stably coupled same-sex relationships. I said, I have what the 15,000 cases revealed, right? You know, maybe we need a study of 150,000 or 300,000. Next slide, please. Um, this is one of the studies that criticized me. Uh, one of the things that they did, they, they analyzed my data because I gave it to them. And they, they said, oh, Mark, once you control for another measure of poverty 
and the stability of the household. We don't see any effects anymore. And I started, I wrote about this saying, my study is a general overview that looks around at the pathways by which people come into these households. Right? What does it mean to sort of control for stability when almost every household you looked at was unstable? Right? They saw that as a criticism of me. I say this is just the reality of households in which these actions are taking place. Next slide, please. All right. I want to conclude over the next several minutes by saying, hey, I didn't have enough cases in my study, perhaps, out of 15,000. I want to tell you about a study that has 1.6 million persons. Okay? This came out a year and a half ago right, by a priest sociologist at Catholic University of America, a friend of mine. I wish I had done this study. Okay? I wish I had. I think it's stronger than the one I just described to you. The sample included 2,751 uh, 2, same-sex couples. Okay? I had adult children who reported to me basically about, what I say, 248 relationships of their, among their parents. This guy's got 10 times, more than 10 times as many. 582 couples, 406 female, 176 male, had children. Right? A lot of these couples don't have children. Right? This is also a problem uh, in sort of the wider debate about uh, same-sex rights is there is a distinction between those couples who do have children and those couples who don't. So I want to tell you about a, a couple studies by Paul Sullins, sociologist at Catholic University of America. Next slide, please. <coughs> These are the, um, so he doesn't have the sample size problem that I have, right? I mean, it's hard to imagine you interview 15,000 people and you still have a sample size problem, but I recognize that it would be nice to have more cases than just 248. But I had more than 78 and 44. But all of a sudden, when I published my study, the, the bar for what was acceptable sample size grew rapidly, right? These are clinical emotional problems. Children with opposite sex parents, children with same sex parents. Okay? Double. Developmental disabilities, ADHD, learning disability, or intellectual disability. Double. Child received medical treatment for an emotional problem. Not just sort of was depressed, received medical treatment, 8.7% versus 16.7%. The child was prescribed medication for an emotional problem, quadruple, 6.5 versus 28.3% children with same-sex parents, children with opposite-sex parents. This is some degree of stability. Okay? Next slide. What does explain those findings? Professor Sullen said, those differences in the child emotional problems were not affected by parent education and income. He controlled for it. I did too. Family stability. He controlled for that. I didn't have enough stability to control for it. Age, race, and sex of the child. Peer stigmatization or bullying. I also controlled for bullying. Bullying is bad, but it doesn't account for the problems. Okay? Parent emotional problems. He controlled for like whether the mom has an issue and does the child have an issue. Right? He said most of these things do affect emotional status and problems but they don't cause more problems in same-sex families than they do in opposite-sex families. They're not the thing that accounts for it. Next slide. What accounts for it? Professor Sullins found after he controlled for biological parentage, whether the child was in a household with two biologically, I mean, their mother and father, that explains it. It distinguishes children being raised by both biological parents, one or none. Right? He concluded that biological parentage was the key factor that explained the differences in emotional problems. He said it's both necessary and it's sufficient to account for. So when he controls for biological parentage, the differences disappear. Okay? We all talk that we I'm operating in a, a, an orbit of where people say there are no differences between. Married fam children with married families, children with 
same-sex couple family. He says, once I account for biological parentage, those relationships are gone. Next slide. <coughs> when you see serious emotional problems, children living with both biological parents have far fewer emotional problems. Not none, but far fewer. Both one or none. Okay? 4, 10, 21. Next slide, please. That's this slide, okay? They have far fewer pr problems. But when he breaks these down, this slide, he breaks down into opposite sex and same sex, right? Opposite sex and same sex. There are no same sex households where mom and partner are both biological parents or dad and partner. It's physically not possible, okay? So we don't have any of these. All of these are opposite sex. We can split the ones where there's one biological parent or no biological parent. Adoption, surrogacy, potentially. One biological parent is where you see the child is a, uh, born to a mother who is in a same-sex relationship. Right? Even here, though, we see 10% of them had emotional problems in opposite sex one bio parent versus same sex, 14.6. No biological parents, 21 versus 19. There's not that much difference here. The key difference, Sullen says, is whether you have both of them or not. Next slide. So the Sullen study has three implications. He said the risk for emotional problems for children in same-sex parent families has nothing to do with parenting practices. Okay? Parenting practices are important. I'm not going to... But they don't account for the emotional problems he saw. If the greatest benefits for child well-being well -being are conferred only on biological offspring of both parents, then same-sex partners, no matter how loving and committed they are, he says, they just cannot replicate what is lost from the biological family, right? They can do a pretty good job under good circumstances, but he says what they can't do is ever replicate the original. People who adopt children is a noble thing to do, often will tell you, you know, We've done this noble thing, we have social support, we, give, we pour into our children, and yet the social science literature still says children who are adopted tend to not fare quite as well as children who stay in their mother and father's household. That's just a, a fact of social science, right? No matter how loving and committed, child well-being is best in mom and dad's household. And he says this problem it's just an essential and permanent feature of same-sex relationships. It cannot be resolved. Surrogacy can't resolve it. Surrogacy doesn't create a biological link between the child and the two parents. It just doesn't. Adoption cannot do it. It's a permanent and essential feature. It's part of the definition. Irreducible difference. It just cannot be overcome. Right? Next slide, please. So, in conclusion, what do we learn? <coughs> Besides the fact that researching in this area is dangerous to your emotional health, right? What do you learn about the kids, right? Parental, same-sex, well, about the parents. The relationships tend not to be long-term ones. We know they exist because the media has found them, right? And they love to talk about them. They're just not the norm. The longer those relationships lasted, same sex or opposite sex, the better for the children. Right? I took the stand in a court case in Michigan, and people asked me, well, what about those two kids in your study whose mom and her partner were with them the entire time growing up? I said, they fared okay. Right? I would expect them to fare okay. Very few same-sex relationships lasted the entirety of the respondent's childhood. Critics were hostile. So this, Mark, you missed them. I said, 
we interviewed 15,000 people. They didn't exist. Maybe they exist more now, but we don't have the data for that. I, I said, the onus is on you to document that. Finally, so critics tried foul. I said, this is just reality. Okay. Finally, the stability afforded by continuously intact mom and dad families, it just it pays benefits well down the pathway, well into adulthood. Right? We talked to some of these kids when they were 39, reflecting on their mother's behavior when they were, say, 12. Okay? Their lives at age 39 were just different because of the instability they experienced, say, when they were age 12 or 13. Pays benefits on average well into adulthood. And I say, I mean, people have criticized me for saying the biologically married mom and dad household is the gold standard. Why would I be criticized? Isn't that what every kid wanted, right? Even if they didn't get to experience that, it remains the standard against which we compare everything, right? And I don't see how that will change anytime soon. Thank you very much.